Hi guys, welcome back. This is episode 121, featuring the third part of my interview with the fabulous Josh, Josh O'Mandell. In this part of the interview, we talk about his game, Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, his thoughts on King's Quest VIII, why he left Sierra, and the future of the adventure game genre. Got a lot of great stuff to cover, so without further ado, here is Mr. Josh Mandel. So it sounds like everything was going uh, brilliantly at Sierra, but uh, actually there was a lot of uh, stuff happening behind the scenes. You ended up quitting. Right. Uh, so what, what, was, uh, what was happening? Well, um, Mist, Mist changed a lot, and all of a sudden... Uh, I think uh, the board of directors uh, were no longer happy with our sales numbers. We had sales in the hundreds of thousands, in the low hundreds of thousands for most of our games, and here they were seeing Mist sell millions. Uh, so expectations went up and tension went up. Uh, we started having almost a revolving door of uh, managers, and each manager would bring in a different style, and they would get a few months uh, to try out their style, and if it didn't work, they left, someone else came in. So there was real chaos going on behind the scenes as we tried to adjust to the new paradigm and uh, opening up the Seattle office at the same time, the Bellevue office. Um, so things were going crazy. They were setting up the other office. They were making arrangements with uh, with some of the designers to move them to Seattle. Uh, and thing, things got very chaotic. And I got the sense, uh, I started to get the sense that we were no longer they're doing games because we loved them. Uh, games were going to be seen as much more of a commodity like sneakers or orange juice. Uh, and um, I no longer had the sense that management, and I, I don't mean Ken I'm, and Roberta, I mean these new managers who were coming in, they did not have the same appreciation for uh, the ethic uh, the um, the history, any, any of those things. They came in and they, they looked at our games as if they were any other product. And that took a lot of the specialness out of it. And frankly, I don't work very well when things around me are chaotic. Uh, I don't think most people work very well when things around them are chaotic. And things got so chaotic that finally I said, I, I, I can't work like this. It's too, uh, it's too insane. Every day brings a new manager or a new edict. Um, uh, they were going to move me to Seattle, which I was perfectly okay with. They were going to um, have me work uh, a little bit on the sequel to Crondor. Uh, but that would be one of the situations where I was the name designer and they would be bringing some other designer in to do probably a majority of the work, but it would come out under my name. And they kept changing the terms of the contract uh, while I was negotiating it with them. And then we finalized a contract, and then I found out a week later that, oh, they had changed a few things in the contract and not told me, and so on. And I said, that I, I can't work like that. That's not the way this company has been to me, and um, I want to go to Legend. So I went to Legend. Legend has a very solid reputation. I was, uh, you know, a lot of great games, including uh, yours, Callahan's Cross Time Saloon, in uh, 1997. Uh, now this was based on the stories of uh, Spider Robinson. Right. Right. So how did this how did this come about? Well, Legend was always interested in uh, doing games that had literary uh, uh, tie-ins. Um, most of the games from Legend probably were based uh, on some existing work of fiction. And when uh, it came my, my turn to, to do a game, the first game actually they wanted me to work on was the Belgariad series, uh, David Eddings. And I spent many months working on a design for that game, and then finally they presented it to, uh, to Eddings. And he didn't even really look at it. Uh, his, his knowledge of... Uh, computer and video games was 
probably limited to like Nintendo style games. So rather than even consider it seriously, he said, oh, I don't want a lot of teenagers running around the universe that I created shooting and stabbing each other. I, I don't have any interest in that. And of course, that wasn't the game I designed at all. Um, so then uh, Mike Verdu and Bob Bates, uh, two, the two uh, co-founders, uh, said, pick two authors that you would like to uh, base a game on. And I gave them Dean Koontz and Spider Robinson. And for whatever reason I'm not sure of, they decided to go with Spider Robinson. It could have been a legal thing because we worked with publishers, uh, book publishers. Um, uh, so they they said, okay, well, uh, let's do um, a Callahan's Cross Time Saloon game. Why those two, you said curiosity? I think at the time those were my two favorite fiction writers um, for obviously very different reasons uh, since their styles are completely different from each other. Uh, I thought Spider Robinson of the Callahan's books would make a terrific game because I couldn't think of a game with a positive outlook. Uh, all the games uh, that were hot those days seemed to be set in dystopian futures uh, and seemed pretty miserable. And, and Spider's message was wholly positive. Uh, and I thought, how refreshing that would be. And also, it's short story format. How much fun would that be to design and play? Uh, so I, I was thrilled when they when they decided to go with Spider Robinson. Parabolus! Parabolus! I'm here, Gingrenich. Here. Here. I'm here, Gingrenich. There you are. How uh, did the budget meeting go? Ooh, about as expected. They didn't withdraw all my funding, did they? They wouldn't eliminate uh, such... The cosmic endowment's been cut by 90%. Universe building is considered non-essential. <laughs> it's over. It's history. Are you happier with the Callahan's Cross Time Saloon or Freddy Farkas? Wow. Um, I am... I'm very proud of both of them. I think I'm probably prouder of Callahan's. Um, the Callahan sense of humor is probably closest to mine because I am a pun lover. Um, I think I'm basically a, a very optimistic person. Uh, Freddy was a spectacular experience that uh, I wouldn't have lost a moment. Uh, well, one or two moments. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but Callahan's was just so much nearer and dearer to my heart right from the start. So even though things were really uh, great at Legend, uh, you had a lot of problems with the uh, with the Take Two Interactive. Uh, so what were those? I mean, I was reading some just incredible incredible stories about how badly they bungled <laughs> yeah. bungled up. So what was going on with these guys? Well, um, I I'm not sure how much I should say, but it's it's kind of public knowledge. I guess that when they got Callahan's and decided to market it, they didn't bother to play it or see what it was about. So the first uh, couple months worth of ads that came out for it advertised it as a Western because they saw a saloon in the title and figured it must be a Western. Um, that was that was kind of a, a screw up. Um, they also accidentally released the beta version instead of the final version. So there is a bug in it that required a patch. Uh, how these mistakes were made, uh, I don't know. I, I wasn't there, and they didn't communicate, certainly with me, uh, about it very much. Um, it, was, it was a real disappointment. Um, but, uh, you know, Legend tried their best to uh, do right by the game, and I don't fault them in the slightest. Uh, I just think Take Two was a much larger uh, entity with its own agenda that had nothing to do with Legends' agenda, and uh, it was not a good match. 
One thing that I, I love about you, Josh, I've been reading all of your uh, previous interviews, and there's so many just quotations that just sort of leap out of the, leap off the page. are quite funny, actually. I think this is probably my favorite. This was from a Just Adventure interview back in 1999. But says, I like to think of myself as an infection injected into a large company to try to shrink it, much like Preparation H shrinks hemorrhoidal tissues. <laughs> Me. So how do, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on this? Well, um, I worked at Sierra, and then they went under, and I worked at Legend, and then they went under. <laughs> and uh, when I went to Sega, uh, they produced hardware and games, and now they just produce games. Um, I, I'm not seriously uh, associating myself with any of those those events, but um, I mean, because that's the way the whole industry is going anyway. I mean, there are there are probably tens of thousands of people who could who could say the same thing. Um, but uh, th my my problem has always been that I'm I'm doing this because I love to be entertained by games, and that is not the bottom line at most companies these days. Uh, it stopped being the bottom line. As far as I'm concerned, it stopped being the bottom line about the time that Legend closed its doors. As far as I was concerned, they were the last adventure game maker that um, approached their products with true integrity. I think Sierra did, and I think Legend did, and I am the luckiest person in the world to have gotten a chance to work and produce things at both of those Publishers, because I uh, developers, because I, I think they are they are the last of their kind. Uh, I hope things change in the industry and we come back to having developers like that again. Yeah, it seems like a, re a motif running through a lot of these interviews. This idea of uh, the industry moving from control by gamers uh, to control by business types really have no uh, interest. Uh, I saw a quotation though about Roberta Williams and uh, King's Quest VIII. And you were saying that even uh, Roberta was uh, just trying to curry favor with the masses, and uh, the game was reactive rather than uh, proactive. Uh, do you still feel that way? About King's Quest VIII? Right. Yes. Um, I, I don't think it's the kind of game that she necessarily wanted to design. I think that the market pressures of the new and improved Sierra were such that and I'm speculating here because I've never discussed it with her. Um, I'm speculating that she probably did not have much of a choice and that that was the kind of game they wanted. Uh, now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe she honestly wanted to try to bridge the gap, say, between something like Tomb Raider and something like King's Quest. Uh, but but I, I think that had Sierra been the company that it was before... Um, before the industry really started to change, it's probably not the game she would have preferred to make. You seem to be uh, insulted by the uh, what's the action adventure genre. I noticed a question about a her a quotation about Tomb Raider, in which you said uh, the adventure element in that game is an insult to gamers' intelligence and devoid of any cleverness or style. <laughs> so, uh, I don't take it you don't like Tomb Raider very much. Uh. Well, I certainly didn't didn't like the original Tomb Raider. Um, I actually haven't played much of of the uh, the sequels, but um, yeah, I mean, I I played the first one, and it was it was as if they had taken one one idea from Adventure Games, which was find the key, and sometimes it wasn't a key; it was an orb or it was a piece of stone, or it was a crystal, but all the puzzles there were basically, you know, find the crystal, put it in the slot, open the door. And it was, I thought it was horribly repetitive and, and very unimaginative. And I don't know, the designer may be out there watching this right now, <laughs> grinding his teeth at me. I don't know who it is, but um, yeah, I hated the adventure aspect of, of Tomb Raider and the Tomb Raider look-alikes that came out as a result. You said that you think that pure adventure games will come back. It's just a matter of time. Just wondering, uh, how long do you think that is? And uh, you, you, we were talking earlier that uh, you even think the text parser may, may come back as well. So, 
I think, I'd love to hear you elaborate a bit on this. Well, I, I think that uh, point and click um, ushered in a generation of gamers who expected something very easy to play, uh, you know, something they could dive right into and, and didn't require typing um, or even a whole lot of imagination. Um, but nowadays, people are used to texting. I mean, everyone's walking around typing. They're just typing on tiny little keyboards instead of full-size keyboards. Uh, I would like to think that uh, the fact that everyone's used to texting now could be used to bring back a parser that would make use of the conventions that texting has. You know, you don't have to type A-R-E when you could just type R. Um, uh, I think that uh, tablets and um, you know, iPhone and other smartphones uh, could be, well, typing on those would not be fun. But on an iPad, fine. And... Uh, uh, it's it's just wishful thinking on my part. I don't know that text adventures are ever going to make a comeback. Uh, I know that for a certain segment of gamers, they never left. There's a there's a good strong interactive fiction uh, uh, group out there, and they keep turning out wonderful games. I don't know that they're ever going to be as popular as they were in the Infocom game uh, days. We were talking earlier about uh, Brian. Uh, Moriarty yeah. uh, wanting to uh, bring some type of speech recognition and use that to revitalize uh, the games, but you don't think that's going to work? Well, um, yeah, he, he. I don't know if he was the first to float this idea, but the uh, the idea that was floated was um, you could take the Infocom games, which stand as stories and games uh, up to anything that's being produced now. They're spectacular stories, well written. Um, and uh, the thought was to have have the text read to you, and have you be able to use speech to give your commands and 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 play the game that way. But to me, that seemed like it would not work because the Infocom descriptions were very colorful and sometimes quite lengthy, and you needed to see those descriptions on screen so that you could parse all the items that were mentioned, all of the locations that were mentioned, and then try doing things with them. If you had to remember all that just as it's being read to you, that, that would be an impossible task. You'd have to have it read to you over and over, and then you'd try a few things, and then you'd forget what other details there were, and you'd have to have it read to you again. I, I didn't see that as being a viable way to, to resurrect those games. <laughs> that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with the fourth and final part of my interview with Josh Hill. Follow that with a retrospective and then begin a new series with Jay Barnson, the designer of a really great game called Frayed Knights, The Skull of Smackdown. Now if you're an old-fashioned CRPG nut like myself, uh, you really must check out this game. You can download the demo for free, uh, but I really want you to buy a copy and support Jay because I really want to see him make some more great games like Frayed Knights. So if you haven't checked that out, I'll uh, post a link in the show notes for you. And as always, I want to thank everyone who has been donating and supporting the, this show. It really means a lot to me. You're, you're keeping this alive. So if you haven't donated or you want to donate, again, uh, go to armchairarcade.com and click on Match Chat, and there'll be instructions for you. Uh, you can set up a one-time payment or a monthly subscription. Either way, really appreciate it, guys. And as always, I want to leave you with a quotation this time from Spider Robinson. It goes something like this. A man should live forever or die trying. See you guys next week. It's over. It's history. Pack it up. <laughs>